Uh, hey, so I'm uh, I'm Colin Carroll. Uh, I'm one of three people who are going to be up here talking today. The other two are actual Matplotlib developers. Uh, I'm not a Matplotlib developer. I wore a PyMC3 shirt so that you could tell uh, where my loyalties are. Uh, but uh, I've had a lot of fun putting this together about how to make custom plots uh, uh, specific to your domain using Matplotlib. And I, I thought this was a useful thing to share. Um, I think this is really good for anyone who is either in a uh, in a company and wants like specific plots for their data science team, um, or if you're in some sort of uh, academic lab and your lab wants to, to have some sort of consistent theme and, and some plots that they use often, uh, or if you're just a person and you like sharing your plots and you'd like your plots to look distinctive, um, I think there's a lot you can take away from this. So, um, the slides are online, and they're online right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I should have left this up while I was telling you about all the wonderful things you're going to be learning. Uh, but uh, you can run them. You can run them along with me. They're, they're being hosted as a static website on GitHub. Uh, and then that static website is generated by a GitHub repository. Um, so that second one is a clickable link. And it assumes you type in that first uh, URL. Then you go and you click on the second link. Oh, and and. Lots of thanks to the Matplotlib team and contributors. So I'm, uh, I'm, unlike PyMC Talks, I did not build any of the Matplotlib code for this. And so I'm really happy that it, it all works. Um, and I do think it's getting a lot friendlier for people who are building libraries on top of it. So I think that there's a lot of work going into it to make it uh, nicer for these domain-specific libraries. Great. So, so one point that we have going on here is that your, your, uh, your plotting function should understand your domain. and so. Uh, one of the, I think, surprising things about Matplotlib is how often it can do the thing that you want without you needing to do uh, extra, uh, extra work around the functions that you're using. Uh, and what we're going to go through today is once you need something extra beyond like dot plot, uh, how do you go and do that? And so how do you make functions that understand your domain, functions that make it easier to visualize your data and to work with the data um, as, you, uh, as you encounter it? Uh, there are examples in the uh, in the wild of this. Um, RVs is a library that uh, I help maintain and build for plotting Bayesian uh, Bayesian data, essentially. So doing uh, visualizations of uh, statistical distributions. Uh, Seaborn and Plot9 are both uh, are both sort of favorites. They also uh, they have a lot to do with statistics. Plot9 is a beautiful sort of uh, grammar of graphics implementation using Matplotlib. Um, that's a really fun library to use. Uh, both pandas and X-ray have plots built in, so they, they understand the uh, the data source that they're looking working with. Uh, and then you have more uh, domain-specific libraries. So you, you've got your mapping libraries. Uh, uh, SK Learn. This this was in the What's Now session yesterday. The plot partial dependence. Um, and then you've got uh, Grave and, and XViz. Um, this is for network data. Um, so. These are libraries already out in the open, open source libraries that you can use for uh, for specific domains. And what we're going to talk about today is there are so many scientists here coming from so many different domains. Uh, you all should be building libraries. And whether or not you open source them is, uh, is sort of up to you. Oh, and if you're following these along, you will have a link to all the third party packages. This is on the Matplotlib um, uh, website. And they've assured me that they will respond to your pull request with great joy uh, if you build a library and want them to list it on there. So. Uh, get on there and uh, and advertise your library. So the first thing I want to uh, to encourage you to do if you are uh, if you are working on domain specific libraries is to use a style sheet. Uh, this is the easiest way to look distinctive uh, and and to use a consistent uh, style across all of your projects. This probably takes an hour and it's a lot of fun to do. Um, there are a lot that are already built into Matplotlib. I'd encourage you. Uh, I would encourage you not to use a built-in style sheet. Make your own. It's really fun. Uh, use the built-in ones if you're, if you're doing something that's reproducible and you don't want to mess with installing the style sheet on whatever machine that is. But, uh, but yeah, make your own. It's a, it's a blast. So this is the default style. You can go back to the classic Matplotlib style. Um, this has got little black outlines around the points. Uh, ggplot, I actually took my first uh, statistics uh, data visualization course with Hadley Wickham while I was at Rice. Um, and he was just sort of starting with ggplot. And this was the theme of his first talk was don't use a default style. Make it something that stands out. It's, it's funny now because like 
ggplot looks like ggplot. You know, like everyone's seen this so many times, um, but it, it, was, it was a very different look at the time. Um, so, so this is also built into matplotlib, um, so you can, you can go and use, uh, use this one. Uh, 538 is super distinctive. They're doing um, a lot of really cool work. Um, this is also ships uh, with matplotlib, so you can, you can use this on your machine right now. Um, much bolder lines, much uh, uh, or sort of thicker lines, very vibrant colors. Uh, this is the one that I make for myself and I use personally. This won't work if you try to use this on your machine. Uh, you would need to go and install my style sheet. Uh, I, I base it on some of the books that Edward Tufte wrote. Uh, so the background color is that subtle beige that he loves. Uh, if, if anyone has his books. Has anyone read Tufte? Awesome. Yeah, so, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and I also stole from uh, the, the beautiful Altair library. They have these, these hollow uh, points as their uh, default markers. And so I stole that because I th just think that looks really cool. Uh, and then the serif font. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's good for reading or bad for reading. I, I do statistics, not style. So <laughs> there you go. So how do we, uh, how do we build these? Uh, I'm going to show you just an interactive way of going and messing around with the styles and coming up with a style that you like for yourself. And what we're going to imagine here is that we're going to build a style that we're going to use for giving talks at a PyData conference. All right, so, so we, we like giving talks. We're, we're going to need some plots. The plots often take up the bottom half of our slide because we have the code on the top half. Um, this is going to be our just test function. I'll usually write up some quick test function that looks like the plots that I like to make. Um, and so here's, here's one. It doesn't really matter except that it fits on one line. Uh, and the plot doesn't really look like much now. Um, it's a little bit small. And so I'm going to go and use plt.rcprams.update. Um, so rcprams is a dictionary uh, type object, so I can call that .update on it. Uh, it'll update all the values. And then when I call plot again, uh, the default figure size will be bigger. Oh. Oh, and we switched the code on these two. So here's how you update the figure size. And on the previous one, I went and updated the, uh, the colors. And so I updated the three colors to be the three primary colors for pi data. So that's the orange, the blue, and the gray. And so now we've got, it'll just keep cycling through those colors. So there are 25 lines here. It'll cycle through the colors eight times and, and one third of one more time. Uh, and now we've got it looking a little more like pi data. There's still some problems, though. I, I, I don't love the lines. I want some markers on here. Um, PyData likes to use, do I even have a, well, PyData likes to use uh, diamonds for their logo. Uh, they got sort of four, four diamonds on their logo. And so I'm going to start using a default marker, and I'm going to set that equal to D, which is, uh, which is the matplotlib for a diamond. The lines now look even more weird, so let's get rid of the lines. We can set the line style to be uh, just empty. Uh, now when you make a plot, uh, again, I'm still just calling plt.plot on that, uh, those 50 random numbers. Uh, I will just get a bunch of diamonds on the screen. But now it's a little small, so we should make those bigger. So I made it extra big. Here's the first time I'm actually cheating. Um, so I'm setting clip on to be false. So now I did have to update my plotting code. The clip on lets your markers go off the edge of your plot. And so that's, that's all that's doing. But the edge of my plot's ugly anyways. I'm, I'm not worried about where these are, are, where these are going. Like no one's really reading the axis. Uh, so we're going to get rid of the spines. The spines are the, are the black box that bounds your plot. And so I can set each of those, the top, bottom, left, and right, to off. You can imagine only turning one or two of these to off. You know, maybe you want the left and the, and the bottom to be, uh, to be activated. Uh, I also turn off the ticks on the bottom and the left. Uh, you could do something wacky if you wanted. You could turn ticks on on the top if you wanted to, a really special plot, and ticks on on the right, or you could have them on on both sides. Uh, and so now this is looking much better. Um, I'm going to do one last artistic flair here. So I'm going to outline it in black. This is just to make it look really nice. I think this pops now. Um, and I think this is a good default th uh, theme for, uh, for making PyData plots. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so let's, uh, so, so if we go and play with this, uh, this is a default, right? So uh, I can go and override these again when I'm calling dot plot. Uh, and if I don't, I might end up with some weird looking plots. And if I'm trying to make art, I might have done a really good job. But if I'm trying to like teach trigonometry and I'm plotting like sine and cosine like this, maybe I've done a pretty bad job. So, <laughs> so you should be aware of your domain. Your style sheet should respect your domain. Your style sheet should do the things that you most often want to do for you. Um, so make your defaults work for you. So what happens once we have these RC params? Um, one thing I did constantly while I was working on this style sheet, working on my own style sheet, is I was printing out the whole RC params dictionary 
so that I could see what keys I have access to. So this is how I see like fig.fig .fig size, and I say, oh, if I adjust that, I'm going to be able to change the default figure size. After you do that, you have to convert your output to this RC params format. So the RC params is going to be a file that you're going to put in a certain directory, and it's going to look in this uh, in this certain format. The easiest way to see this is to just look in an existing uh, RC params file. Um, this one's a valid RC params file, and we're going to save it as mystyle.mpl style. So we've got a file, mystyle.mpl style. We're going to go put it in the matplotlib configuration directory. Um, you can find out where that is, matplotlib.getconfigdir, um, and then it's in, inside style lib there. And so you can go in there. You can also see what, uh, what styles already exist. There are ways to do that from inside the library too. Um, but you can go in there and, and, and see other examples of your style sheets. Once it's in there, though, you can just use your default styles. So then you don't have to do all this update params every time you start a notebook. You just open the notebook, call plt.style.use, you know, name of your lab, uh, and then you'll have this custom style applied uh, by default whenever you're plotting. So this is, this is a really quick way of getting started on having just a default look. You know, share this file with everyone in your lab. Then any plots that come out from, from your group will all look consistent. They'll look great. Um, everyone will be impressed. Uh, you can also pip install this if you're, if you're careful. Um, and the last thing I want to say, I, I don't know if anyone else, whenever you plot with a histogram, like you understand that you should look at it with 10 bins or 20 bins, and there might be some, something weird going on. But I just wanted to do auto bins first. Um, so that is a choice that you can set. You can set uh, these defaults using your uh, style sheet. Uh, and so if you go in there and set hist.bins to be auto, um, then you no longer have to pass that command in when you're calling uh, plt.hist. So, so let me pass off to more. By last thing, he only meant his section. We promised there's more. <laughs> okay, now, so you have pretty, right? You now have a straight corporate look, straight look, kind of everything coming out of your lab. We're set. How many of you have a plot you all need to make all the time? It's like it's the same plot, you just have like, you know, we need to tweak one little thing and that's always different? How many of you all have that shoved in some function in a, some strange way that ends up being not useful except outside of your one Jupyter notebook? How many of you even put it in a one Jupyter note in a function and don't just copy and paste the same cell? <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the proper or the Matplotlib recommended way to package your plotting function so that we can nicely reuse it, dump it into a .py file, share it around. Step one, wrap your plots. What we're doing here is we're going to make a plotting function. Let's make confetti. First things first, what? Okay, how many of you use Seaborn? Good people. So, how many of you used to use on Seaborn, you want to just do sns.plot and it makes the thing? How many of you would like it so that your own function, if I do my, my library.plot, it'll just make the thing? Great, so that is why we have that if AX is none, AX equals plot.dca. What that will do is it'll make the axis for you and in matplotlib land, the axis is the thing we plot on. So do that plot.dca, now you can just, it's created. And the reason we put that in an if statement like this is how many of you can get away with just having one figure, one plot on your figure and that's done? How many of you need stuff side by side? You need two side by side, three side by side, a 15 panel? Yeah, so when you need the 15 panel, you need that option of being able to pass in the axis. So that's why we have, as part of our style guide, you pass in the axis. The reason we have that pass in the axis after the star is here we only have one parameter. How many of you need to have more than one parameter that you're plotting? A lot of you, right? And what we don't want to happen is we accidentally pass in the axis as the Y or the K or the, you know, Z. So if we have that AX equals none after the star, this is a Python 3 thing, now it's a mandatory named argument. You have to say AX equals AX for it to work. And the reason now we don't just shove it into keyword gogs is we want to make it explicit that our keyword gogs are pass-throughs. And with lib. The keyword gogs are our shiny customization. Because, wait, we've done a style sheet, right? How many of you, like, I have a set style, but now you need to do something different for this one thing? 
My, this is fairly common. So what the passing through the keyword logs lets you do is overwrite your style sheet. So here, we're doing it for our plot. So this will make our confetti. Now, there's one thing though, right? Which keyword log here have I set in my function, in my call to plot? The keyword logs are the things of x is equal to y. Clip on equals false, right? And that is not a thing you should do because I've been told that it creates some kind of weird race condition where your sometimes compiler does not know what you're trying to do. So race conditions, bad, right? So what we'll do is on our second function is we'll use set default, keyword dot set de default. And what it'll do is if your user passes in clip on, it'll use what your user passed through. If they haven't, we've set false. And now, because it's always set one or the other, we don't have any ambiguity of what we're trying to do. Because we're just updating the dictionary here, essentially. OK, got salto, got confetti. Now, what's the next thing we want to do? We've made the functions. We need to use them. So let's use. We're going to use confetti, and we just call it the way we would any other plotting function. In this case, we don't even need a plot dot because it's in our scope. Right. The thing is, sometimes we need to do more than one plot, right? We need a line and we do multiple lines. Well, it's a plotting method. It wraps access. We can layer two confetti and the second confetti. And because we can pass the keyword logs through, we can do, we can pass in, we can customize. We can change our marker. We can change our marker size because, yes, we've set everything in the style sheet. But the style sheet is the first level. You can then, like, force things out and update them with your custom parameters, which is what we're doing here with the marker size and marker size and the marker. And, right, so we want to customize, and then we also want to compose. So we can pass in our axis. We can set up our subplots. Now we are going to have two, col two rows of data, and we can layer the line plot at the top and our point plots underneath. And because we've set up these functions with the axis, right, this is how pandas works. This is how Seaborn works. It's a standard pattern. If you want to compose third-party packages, you can just layer that. You can pass in your axis, and then it puts it on the grid. And the other thing it does, which we haven't shown here, is I can now use my plot, and that's in one grid cell, and a pandas plot in a second grid cell, and a Seaborn plot in a third grid cell, and a Cardopy in a third. And I can use all the libraries together. OK. Great. So now we can make our own plots. What happens if one of Mapa lives something like 50 plot types isn't good enough, right? My domain, it's just like, it just doesn't exist in the basic set. Well, Colin will tell you about that. Awesome. Yeah. So the, the theme here is we're going sort of deeper and deeper for more and more customized plots. And so you can get really far just wrapping the, uh, the accessors that you have on the surface here. Uh, but if your domain need is, is something deeper, uh, I'm really interested in two things, my dog and messing with photographs. Uh, so we're going to uh, wrap a function that does both those things. Um, on the left, you can see my dog. His name is Pete. He's adorable. On the right we're, is what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to build this today, a bunch of horizontal lines that sort of approximate uh, what Pete looks like. Um, and so we're going to need some way of drawing a line with varying widths. Uh, and that's... Uh, if anyone's ever tried to do that with matplotlib, it's it's a little bit tough. So we're gonna we're gonna have to go dig in there and and build our custom plot. So let me first just describe how we're gonna build um, this idea. So uh, this isn't as important about matplotlib. Um, it is important that everyone see how cute his face is and his nice pauses. Um, he's a really cute dog. When you load this into into matplotlib, you get uh, uh, three matrices, right? One for each color channel. Um, that's going to turn out to be more complicated than we need for dealing with, so I'm going to immediately cut it down to grayscale, and that's what we're going to work with for the rest of this. Once we have grayscale, I want to figure out some way of turning this into a bunch of horizontal lines, and, and one sort of naive way is we could, uh, right, the grayscale is a matrix, just a single matrix, it's 600 by 800, all the values are between 0 and 1. I might make another uh, matrix, we'll call it a mask, and it's just... 25 lines where the value is entirely one and in between everything else is zero. 
So we've got, we've got this mask matrix. We've got this matrix with a picture of Pete. We can do a pointwise multiplication. Um, but you, you can't really see that there's a dog there necessarily. Uh, you're not really discovering anything else that's not exactly on one of those 25 lines. You can only see what's, what's right there and not what's kind of nearby. And I want some way, you know, this is a hazy approach. I want some way of seeing like how wide my line should be at any given point. So it turns out the right idea is blurring that mask a little bit. So I, I take the same 25 lines, I apply, I apply this sort of vertical blur to it. And when I do the same pointwise multiplication, I get this nice picture. You can, you can see that there's a dog back there. I can pick, pick an intensity so that any pixel darker than that, I'm going to turn it entirely black. Any pixel lighter than that, I'll turn entirely white. Uh, and we'll get, we'll get this, which is looking a lot closer to what I'm hoping my end product will look like. From here, I go through, I cut it up into the 25 bins surrounding each of these, uh, each of these dark lines. And I use uh, this efficient NumPy function where I'm just going to go walk along each line and count how wide the dark pixels are around there. And that's going to be my line width. Uh, I went through and tried, right, because you can count upwards and downwards. And I went through and tried min or mean or median, um, but it, it turns out that the, uh, the max is the one that looks right. And so once I get that, this is the only point where I need a special matplotlib function because I want to go and turn this into lines. And so going from that, that last plot to this plot is the one spot where I needed to, uh, needed to build my own custom function. This is still a little thin, but what I got to do was I took the widths that I calculated using NumPy and I passed them in to matplotlib and got 25 just horizontal lines with varying widths. So I can, I can vary the width along the, uh, along the length of the line. Uh, this is too thin, but since I have access to the widths and they're just NumPy arrays, I can just multiply them by 10. Now I've got thicker lines and they're sort of uh, sketching out what the dog looks like a little better. Um, again, they're just uh, NumPy vectors, so I can smooth these out a little bit. Uh, so you can see it goes from boxy and then I just do smooth. So this is running a smoothing kernel along each uh, width vector. Uh, and then also, uh, since I'm just doing lines, I can also apply any sort of other sort of styles I want using matplotlib. Um, you, you can see that we're, we're going sort of crazy with doing this, but uh, I'll just apply color on, uh, on each of the lines. And so it starts, uh, goes through this rainbow color map, uh, depending on which, which horizontal line it is. Any, any questions about how we built this? I'm going to go back and talk about how the artist, how we actually got onto the artist. Um, but any time with your dogs on there. Yeah. How come do the lines look filled in before? When the first graph, it just looked like the solid black. I couldn't see any spaces. Now I can see the spaces. Yeah, so the question was, how, uh, how can you see the spaces in the line? When it, when it was just the graph, you, could, you couldn't see the spaces. Um, and so, so it was sort of trying to erase some of this uh, white space. But a lot of it also comes from this discretization that where, where I actually bin it up into 25 different uh, sort of horizontal bins. Uh, yes, this this is all I'm working with an image right here, um, and so so this is one object that Matplotlib knows how to plot, and then I turn it into another object that it knows how to plot. Cool. So so how does the line collection actually work? Um, I, I I went through and and uh, you know I looked for the right artist that I needed to use in order to uh, in order to work work with this plot that I wanted to make. Um, I found line collection that sounded likely. Um, right, I need something that can go and, and change the widths of the line mid, uh, midstream. And so you open it up, and the first argument it expects is a segment uh, segment argument. And this is a very nested list. So it's a list of lists of tuples. Uh, and so I decided to just try this uh, manually first. And, and so I entered three different, uh, different segments. The first one is, is just a constant line all at uh, height 1. The second one is the line y equals x plus 1. And then the last one is y equals x squared. And I just enter the first four integer points for those, um, just to see what it does. A couple things to notice about the artist is that I have to actually add it to my axis. So I use collection to add the line collection in, onto my artist, uh, onto my axis. Uh, and then the second thing is I'm handling the uh, limits of the plot myself. So I'm setting x lim and y lim uh, manually. But I'm, I'm remembering what my goal is here. My goal is to have a, a line with where I can change the width sort of midstream. Uh, and so I, I go and look at the other attributes that you can pass in colors and line widths and line styles. But it looks like that applies to each separate line, each of the three lines, and not to one single line. So I, I'm still not quite there in terms of changing the width of a single line. Uh, but can anyone see with the, uh, with the tools I have available what you might do from here in order to change it midstream? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually, whoops, 
I'm going to actually go and each of my segments will just be a line of length one. And the end point of the previous segment will be the start point of the next segment. And this is what I'm going to do in order to, to be able to change the attributes of a line sort of point by point. So each segment is going to be styled separately. So I'm going to have sort of, sort of these, uh, these four points, which defines three line segments. And then I'm going to be able to pass three colors, three line widths, or three whatever styles to it that I want. So this is great. This plot's not as flashy or as cool as the other plots we've been showing. So let's go and make it flashy and cool, because uh, you know, that's what we're all here for. Uh, how are we going to do that? I, I like parabolas. Parabolas are easy to work with because uh, they've got curves to them, and, and you can sort of tell visually whether you're getting it right. Um, so I'm going to define x to be my lin space. y is going to be x squared. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, v-stack those two together. So I'm going to get a, an n by 2 matrix. Uh, I bet that there's people with 30 different ways of making an n by 2 matrix out of two vectors, and I bet this is one of the worst ways. But uh, this is a bit of a bank shot to get your, your, uh, your nice matrix. And then what I do is I zip it together with itself. So I, I take that entire uh, n by 2 matrix all the way up to the second to last entry, and I zip it together with that n by 2 matrix starting at the second entry, going all the way to the end. And that's, this is going to do exactly what I was describing before, where I do the first point goes to the second point, then that second point is the start of the, the next segment, and it goes to the next point, point. it keeps on going down like this. And so it's just going to be, uh, I guess Linspace is 100 by default, it'll be 100 segments uh, all one after another, and I can style them separately. So what does this look like? The, the first thing we should do is just go test that this actually works. Um, so this is the, the whole code to make that work. So again, I make the line collection using those segments I just put together. Um, I add the collection onto my axis. I set the uh, x and y limits. Uh, and it looks good. It looks like a normal, uh, normal parabola. So, so, so far, mission accomplished. Not that flashy. So let's see what else we can do. Our whole goal was to adjust widths. Uh, and so I can actually take, uh, take my x values and set the line widths based on that. So I'm using this trig function, uh, right? I'm, I'm using the absolute value because your widths should probably be positive. Um, I didn't even test it if it did fine. If it was negative, maybe it would. Um, and then I multiply it by 30 so that it's wide enough that it, that it looks reasonable. And now it's getting a little, little flashier, um, but we can do better. Um, so the next thing I do, I, I grab the Veritas uh, color map and I also apply a, uh, a per point color to my uh, lin space. And so this is going to go and not only do I get the, the widths, but I also get the colors. And the color has half the period that the widths do. So you get this sort of cool uh, rotating effect. Cool. So, uh, we'll get questions at the end. <laughs> uh, again, you know, uh, Hannah drove this forward that you should really be uh, wrapping the custom uh, use cases you want for your domain into functions. So I'm going to wrap this into a function. Um, this is essentially encapsulating the little trick that we did earlier. So we're, we're again, zipping the function with itself, the, the x, y data with itself. We're putting it at that points. Um, and then we're, we're getting the line collection. And I, I left out some part where I'm calculating some, uh, um, some reasonable defaults for your axes. Once we have that, um, this took about five slides earlier to, to put up. But now it only takes one slide. Uh, right, we can get go right from the lin space and and nothing in our uh, nothing in our environment to having a full plot of a parabola with this uh, wild coloring, and and a, a great side effect of this, and this is uh, sort of again why I think everyone should have their own plotting library for their own specific domain for their expertise is you can start playing with this. Uh, so if it's easy to plot, if it's easy to visualize, you're going to make a lot more interesting visualizations. You're going to explore your space a lot better. Um, so so this is uh, sort of what I did as soon as I got this function. I was, I was sort of thinking whether I could uh, make a Mobius band uh, by uh, just faking my eyes into thinking that I was in three dimensions. So this is still using a two-dimensional matplotlib plot, um, but I give it three turns uh, by, by adjusting the width to, to uh, go to zero three times. Uh, and then I chose the color map just right so that it kind of looks as though if you, if you squint at it, there's only one side on this thing. Uh, so this is a fun plot to make as well. Great, and let's, uh, let's finish up with, uh, with Tom himself. Hi, so the, those are, that's a tough act to follow. So I guess this, the, the last part of this is once you have a collection of Python functions, you can now package this like any other Python library um, with all the ease and difficulty and contain, you know, 
that goes with that. So um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit from the applied and practical to a bit more um, philosophical might be a little strong, but like how, uh, how I think about matplotlib. And that there's this ten, you know, so matplotlib really has two very distinct um, faces. One of which is it with, which is an application. So plt.plot, like it makes it get if you just have an x and a y, it gets them on the screen as quickly as possible. Plt.scatter, you know, you can get your x, y, and your and your bubble size up in one line of code. Um, but on the other hand, it also serves as a library, you know, as a base library for building these more um, involved visualizations. And then this, then this duality leads to a particular sets of tensions, right? Because if you want a library, like it's the goal of a library is not necessarily to be used at a REPL by the end user. Uh, it's to help someone build tools for that end user. Um, whereas an application is to help you, you know, help the end user do something right now as quickly as possible. Um, on one hand, if you're a library, you want to be very explicit. You want to have lots of arguments. You want them to have nice, long, readable names. Uh, if something goes wrong, you want to raise, you know, you want to fail fast and let whoever's calling you sort out what to do, because, you know, the handling, you know, the reason we have exceptions is because you don't know what to do. Uh, on the other hand, an application is supposed to do the right thing. But, um, you know, in my experience, if you ask five scientists what the right thing to do in a particular situation is, you'll get about six answers. Um, and so, like, the right thing is a very subjective thing. It can be very specific to, to a domain, to what that particular, you know, to the degree of, like, what that particular person is doing. And that, you know, when, you know, when things fail, you know, or what the default should be, one person will argue very strongly it should be A, and the other person will argue very strongly it should be B, and that within their spaces, they're both completely right. But at the core library level, we can't do both A and B. We have to do something. So... Uh, I think the the message I would like to take away from this is that um, if Matplotlib is not serving you like out of the box correctly as an application, please build the interface you need on top of us. So, the to wrap up the you know the 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 lowest investment is just wrap the base function. So if you don't like the default behavior is quite right. If you want to um, if you want to tweak something about the signatures, you can write a short little five line function that turns it from our, you know, very general one to one that's very tuned to whatever you do day to day as you type. Um, the slightly more involved one is to do a, uh, Colin showed us at the end of writing a function that doesn't use any of our built-in uh, plotting routines, but just instantiates the artist directly to, to, you know, with what, you know, based on whatever input you need to give it. And uh, the third, which we're not, you know, we're not going to touch on today, is that it's actually possible to write your own artists if you need to do something that's completely out of um, out of what we, we ship in the base library. But as long as you provide the correct, correct interface, you can drop that into an axis and it'll draw, draw, draw like anything else. So uh, with that, please, if you have any questions, if you're working on a third-party library, please come talk to us. Uh, we usually stood up a Discord server, uh, and we'd love to hear from all of you. And so with that, are there any questions? No questions? Yes. One question. Yeah. Hi. Um, I noticed you use GTA, so you use the get current axis. Do you suggest this to create a new figure or the get the current axis? So the, the, the question was we, you know, in the, in, And, and here we're doing plt.gca to get the current access, which if no access exists, will create one. And if you have one, it will use it. Um, I think that is um, that is an application-specific question. There's some context where you want your plot function to be able to add it, overlay onto an existing figure. And there's others where you might be, you know, your function might be setting up a multi-panel figure. In that case, there's not clear how it should figure out what axes on that figure are there, and it should make a new figure. And for, if you look at pandas, um, dataframe.plot does plt.subplots inside to get you a new figure, and uh, series.plot does plt.gca to add it to whatever axis you're working on. And so that's, a, that's something that you can tune based on what your needs are. Yeah. Uh, so 
if I'm writing a third party library and I want my, my own distinctive style, um, is, is there a way to do that without making sure that I don't, like if I use RC params, is that going to override like, the global styles and if you know, they try to write other plots outside my library, is that going to affect those? Like, What's the best way to scope it to only the plots I generate? So the, the, the question was, if you're setting RC params, that's a global parameter, and it will, you know, that will affect every plot made. Um, so you can use, uh, we have context managers for RC params. So you can do with, you know, uh, I think it's, it's with style, pass in a dictionary of RC params, and those will be applied within that context block. And then when you come out, they get reset to the defaults or to whatever the current state is. Also, you can do the with style with just the name of your style. So like with oh, style 538, which is also if you're doing like a giant notebook and you want to mess around with different styles, you can do all of that within context so you don't screw up your whole plot list. Is your style guide available online somewhere in non-video form? Uh, you, you mean which style guide? The so you were saying things like um, you should accept an argument named AX, and if it's none, set it to plt.gca, like the other guidelines like that. Mm, no. I'm trying to go to the oh, opening. Oh, yeah. oh I'm, I'm, I'm failing. It's like, it's like we, to find the website, but it's in the docs. Okay, they're going to look for it in the docs. It's in our docs under the developers, either under, oh, it's under tutorials usage. Yeah. It's a section called, like, how do we, the preferred wrapping guide. Do you have a more question? Also, we forgot to mention it, but as part of this whole build maintainable libraries, we also have our own test suite called MPL test. So when you build your library, you can then test your library. You can write functions against it. You can do pure image tests, which is a lot how we do a lot of our testing. So as part of the packaging step. And again, if you want to learn more about that, reach out to us, Discourse, Twitter, find us here, all the things. Oh, sprint tomorrow, right. We're going to be sprinting tomorrow, 9 to 12. All right. Uh, please thank you, our speakers.